Welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm your host, Joseph Clark. Thanks for tuning in. Our show features candid interviews with martial arts stars about how they endeavor towards their goals, overcome unfortunate human events and life challenges, and how they better themselves and pursue personal excellence through martial arts. Over the next two hours, we have a very, very impressive lineup of guest interviews. Now, I'm going to bounce a few names off of you who you might have heard of. Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, George Shavalo, Roberto Duran, Lennox Lewis, and Sugar Ray Leonard. One of our guests this evening is Canadian network broadcaster Mark Hepsher, who has interviewed all of the aforementioned fighters. The next guest interview is with UFC lightweight mixed martial artist Jason Sago from my 2015 live broadcast interview. And our final interview will be with kickboxing pioneer, champion, and legend, special guest, Benny the Jet Urquidas. For those of you listening to us while on your phones, tablets, or laptops, be sure to check out www.worldblackbelt.com, the world's foremost martial arts online community, which was established by Bob Wall, and Chuck Norris. Be sure to check out our show website at www.mawradio.com. You can also catch us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter at Martial Arts World Radio. I have two books to bring to your attention this week. Google the book The Tao, that's T-A-O, Tao of MMA, or go to Amazon and do a search for The Tao of MMA. Another book that I highly recommend you check out is entitled The Way of the Fight by George St. Pierre, a very entertaining and inspirational book about how GSP overcame bullying as a child and turned that experience into an opportunity to pursue personal excellence. This week's inspirational quote is from Miyamato Musashi and goes as follows, you can only fight the way you practice. Miyamato Musashi, A Book of Five Rings, circa 1645. Before we get into our first interview, I would like to reflect on something with you. In 2015, I conducted interviews with martial arts, artists, and professional fighters in Canada, the US, and the Orient. After conducting and reviewing these interviews, it would seem that there are three prevalent streams in martial arts, classical, slash traditional martial arts, mixed martial arts, MMA, and martial arts in cinema. Complementing these, while at the same time independent of these, is Western boxing and wrestling. Are there overlaps? Absolutely there are, in all areas. There are overlaps both in the participants and the audience. However, the classical, traditional crowd focuses on the dojo the amateur sports and the tournaments. The MMA crowd associate more with the gym and follows the UFC and other independent up and coming MMA fight promotion leagues, which are feeding into the UFC. This is not to say that all MMA fighters are devoid of a traditional background. However, a vast majority train in a fast track boot camp style with MMA becoming a style unto itself, like cross training. The cinema crowd is where champions from all streams go to monetize their blood, sweat, and tears. During the various interviews, common themes included recognizing MMA as the inevitable future of martial arts in popular mainstream culture, a concern that less and less traditional influence will result in less traditional values incorporated into training curriculum, and a sense of history respecting the innovators such as Bruce Lee, Ed Parker, Gene LaBelle, Bob Wall, and Chuck Norris. And yet, there were several optimists who believed that martial arts will continue to evolve the human spirit, and that martial arts will continue to rise in popularity until it is the dominant pastime. I had the good fortune to conduct these interviews during a very progressive time In MMA, women fighters have taken the UFC by storm. Ronda Rousey has become one of the most recognizable athletes in the world. In cinema, martial arts movies are now produced with respectable budgets. 
The genre is one of the most popular. Martial arts are incorporated into the choreography of the majority of action movie fights. Even movies that are not martial arts films have martial arts fight scenes. The UFC is now producing champions who are becoming millionaires from sponsorships and branding. George St. Pierre appeared in the Avengers sequel. Randy Couture has been a main character in the Expendables movies. Traditional martial arts is in the forefront at the Pan Am and Olympic Games. Wrestling, along with boxing, is no longer looked upon as less exotic as traditional martial arts. Instead, they are now respected as a monumental part of MMA. Bruce Lee was preaching about freestyle martial arts in his day. The opening scene from Enter the Dragon was an impressive demonstration of MMA which would stand up nicely in any movie today. At the same time that there is partisanship in traditional martial arts, there's also a sense of global community. When Bob Wall hosted me at his home, I detected that he took pride in his sense of history of martial arts and the role he played. He was supportive of these interviews, and I observed that he recognized it important to martial arts that such interviews and feedback be shared to document the opinions and viewpoints of the old and wise, as well as the new and up and coming. Stylists tend to be protective and understandably biased about what they practice. The common theme in martial arts has been an open mind, adapt, innovate, integrate styles, pursue personal excellence. Those themes are stronger than ever and apply to all, st all th uh, streams. I felt challenged with where and when to end the interviews. How many interviews are enough? Did I include enum, enough women versus men? Did I include enough MMA fighters versus cinema fighters and traditionalists, etc.? I believe the answer is there is never enough. As the listener, I encourage you to expand on and take part in the consciousness and appreciation of the history and legacy of combat arts. Continue asking questions of those you encounter in the global martial arts community. Where have we been? Where did it all start? Who were the pioneers and influencers? Are we missing something in the new styles that was effective in the old? As a martial artist and a person, what do I believe in? What do I stand for? What will be my contribution? I wish you well on your journey, young grasshopper. This is Martial Arts World Radio. We shall return after this short break with our 2015 interview with UFC lightweight fighter, Jason Sago. Welcome back to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm Joseph Clark. I had the privilege of interviewing UFC lightweight fighter, Jason Sago in 2015. Here is that interview. Jason is a professional mixed martial artist who has a contract with the UFC the world's largest fight promotion company. Jason has been featured in the media as a fighter with a will of steel her, who pursues personal excellence at the same time that he practices humility. Jason travels the globe seeking out top places to train and master his skills. He believes that martial arts attracts people who possess a strong will, a desire to improve, and a humbleness that comes only after years of training and defeat. We will be speaking to Jason tonight about how he has persevered through life's hurdles and become a better person through his journey towards personal excellence and his professional athletic goals. Jason, thank you for joining us and welcome to the show this evening. Thanks for having me, Joseph. I really appreciate it. Well, we appreciate it as well. It's a pleasure. And specifically, where are we speaking to you tonight? I'm uh, currently right now in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. Uh, a beautiful part of the country. <laughs> And Jason, what are your current priorities and activities right now? Um, you know, I just got finished up my first training session of the day, and now I'm just going to go uh, grab some healthy food at the grocery store and then have about three or four hours rest and recuperate, and then I'm going to head back into uh, training for tonight. Uh, I'm getting to do uh, my rounds in preparation for my fight on October 4th in Halifax. So your full-time job is training to fight. Yeah, exactly. My full-time job now that I've been in the uh, UFC, it's been really 100% focused on martial arts and training and just uh, getting ready for this fight, really. I mean, October 4th is the date, so we're coming up to the three, week, three weeks away, so I've just been 100% focused on that and making sure I'm in the, the best shape of my entire life. And what is the date exactly again of that fight? 
It's uh, October 4th. That'd be Saturday, October 4th, and it's in uh, Halifax at the Metro Center. In Halifax, okay. And what martial arts styles are you trained in? Um, I formerly trained in uh, Muay Thai. I did my, a lot of my Muay Thai training in Thailand, as well as uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I trained under my head coach's name is Paul Abel. Uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and mixed martial arts under him. And uh, wrestling, uh, I trained a little bit while I was in university, as well as uh, over here on the island, uh, Matt McGrath uh, helped me a lot with my wrestling, as well as uh, Chris Prickett, who's a, a national wrestler for, for Canada. Excellent. So multiple styles, and sounds like you have some good trainers. Yeah, really good trainers. I wouldn't be anywhere close to where I am without my trainers. So, uh, I mean, I really do owe it all to them. And you are, I believe, fighting in the lightweight weight class, correct? That's correct, yeah. Lightweight division is 155 pounds or 70 kilos. And when you're not at your fighting weight, what would your, your day-to-day weight be? I guess like my current uh, walk-around weight right now is around 172, 173. Um, about a week out from weigh-in is about 168, 169. Okay. And when you cut weight, then it sounds like you cut a significant amount of weight for weigh-in. So when you actually step into the octagon, what weight do you estimate you'll probably real like the actual weight? I usually you'll be jump back at? up to 170, so I gain about 15 pounds in 24 hours. And how do you gain that 15 pounds? Is that just strictly water, Gatorade? How are you doing that? Um, it's really important the way you rehydrate your body. So. I usually like to have uh, a lot of coconut water, got a lot of natural electrolytes in there, um, and just be small, be careful with your, your meals, you know, so you don't want to have a ton of food right after you finish weighing in because you get really sick to your stomach, so after losing, you know, 15 pounds in 24 hours, you want to make sure that you slowly, you know, put food back in your system, so very just small, 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 tiny meals, you know, fruits and vegetables, nothing, nothing heavy or else you, you become nauseous. And what is your fight record at this point? Ten wins and uh, one loss. Very interesting. So ten wins and one loss. And where were you fighting mm-hmm. prior to uh, the UFC professionally? Local shows. Um, I, I've fought really. I mean, I fought in Ireland for one of my my first my pro debut was actually in Ireland, and then I fought in Canada, Montreal. I've been to uh, Edmonton. Um, I did the first ever official card in Ontario um, at Casino Rama. So just all over from uh, coast to coast. How many fights would you have done as a amateur before you did your first professional fight? I did three fights as an amateur. I did one in Detroit, and my other two were in Thailand. Were in Thailand. That must have been very exciting. Yeah, because you don't know what you're getting into in Thailand. <laughs> Let's just say there's not as many uh, regulations as there is in Canada. <laughs> oh, is that right? Do they f- yeah, you know, there's less rules. Um, you don't really know what you're getting into till you're actually in the, the, you know, the ring or the cage. So, I mean, it's uh, Thailand's a very unique place, and it's just kind of a little, it's a little less safe than Canada. When you were fighting in Thailand, were you fighting Muay Thai or were you fighting MMA? I actually fought both. I fought pro Muay Thai while I was in Thailand. I did two, two uh, pro Muay Thai fights while in Thailand, and I did uh, two amateur MMA fights while in Thailand, and I did a jiu-jitsu competition as well in uh, Singapore. So, Jason, what was more difficult for you, fighting Muay Thai or fighting MMA against, uh, in Thailand against a Thai opponent? Um... When I fought MMA, it was like internationally. So like there, I think I fought. Oh, actually, I did. I ended up fighting a guy from Canada who we ended up becoming really good friends. He's actually originally from Brampton, not Ontario, not too far away from my home. But we ended up uh, fighting in Thailand, became good good friends. His name's Mike Hutchison. And the other guy I fought was actually from Sweden uh, for the MMA fight. And uh, the Muay Thai fights, I fought a guy from Japan. And then the first one was a, uh, a guy from Thailand. So it was a really good uh, experience being able to fight, uh, I guess, on an international level because everyone's from different backgrounds, you know, different coaches, different styles. So I think going over to Thailand to compete was a really good life experience. 
Is it tougher to compete at the amateur level or at the professional level? 100% professional level because as soon as you have money involved, uh, people start taking it a lot more seriously. So at the amateur level, you know, people can do it for fun and, you know, it's not too serious. Maybe they're not training twice a day and they're a little bit more, more lax and they're not as, uh, I guess, well-rounded. But at professional level, everybody is really good. They're really good at wrestling. They're really good at jiu-jitsu. They're really good at striking. So if you're going to take it uh, to a professional level, it's also more dangerous. You know, you're dealing with smaller gloves. Uh, less less rules like an amateur you're not you know sometimes when the fight hits the ground you're not even allowed any striking but in professional professional fights you're allowed striking as much as you want when the fight hits the ground so amateur is more safe and there's not as much money involved and people I think sometimes just tend to train for a little bit and then they do it for fun but professional you're going up you're, you're taking the next level for sure so for uh, our audiences that are in front of their laptops or their tablets or phones today uh, if you Google Jason Sago, or or even Google Jason Sago UFC, you'll see there's some good hits that come up. I know there's a CBC article that came up. Uh, I think there were a couple of other really good media stories about you and some video about you getting your UFC contract. Is there some? Cool. Are there some other areas in the web where you would like to direct our listeners to go? Um, just uh, definitely just my my website www.jasonsago.com as well as uh, follow me at, at Twitter at Jason Sago and uh, Instagram Jason Sago. So you can follow kind of all those social uh, media links and even on uh, Facebook Facebook fan page. So we kind of just rotate and I put different uh, content on every one of those pages. So if you're following like the Facebook page, you're gonna get a lot more about my my training. You know, and if you're really into mixed martial arts, you probably want to follow that. To show some drills, some techniques, but if you're into like you know more lifestyle stuff, just what I do outside the cage, like paddle boarding, you know, hanging out on the beach and just going on a little bit of uh, mini excursions and the travel adventures and stuff, that could be more like Instagram and uh, some some Facebook, some uh, of the personal page. Jason, what a great guest you are because you just segued into another fantastic line of questioning. <laughs> what do you do when you're not training and fighting? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm really laid back. You know, I just like to uh, enjoy life, spend a lot of time with my girlfriend. We're pretty active. I love going paddle boarding, especially in Prince Edward Island. It's such a beautiful place to live. And there's so many just small little uh, lakes, you know, and just going out to the ocean and having that sense of freedom. So lots of great trails we go hiking on, um, even a little bit of mountain biking. Uh, just lots of exploring here too there's we've lived here for over a year and a half and there's we're still discovering you know those little special gems on the island so it's been awesome sounds like a terrific place and a terrific way to spend your time yeah thanks and jason in terms of your uh your strengths uh, what would you recognize as a professional fighter are some of your strengths the areas that you dominate um, I would say definitely like my discipline, like being able to go through the grind of every day, the dedication to be able to just show up to training after you, you know, you've gotten your butt kicked, you know, for the last, you know, six to eight weeks during your training camp and being sore, beat up, bruised, cut open and showing up the next day with a smile on your face and ready to do it all again. I think the, that's one of my strongest uh, attributes is just, you know, being dedicated and putting the time in. So you're tough. Yeah, I guess you could say that, yeah. <laughs> You're tough. Good for you. Yeah, because I would think uh, it's one thing to have ambition. It's another mm -hmm. to have sincere determination where you're able to get up early in the morning, be able to take that right. abuse, to, uh, you know, I ignore the cravings and hunger pangs when you have to diet mm -hmm. and eat, eat food that mm -hmm. might not be terribly exciting. So you must live yep. a very disciplined and rigorous lifestyle. Exactly, and I think that's a requirement, right? If you're always trying to make weight, you can't just go out and eat what other people are, are, are eating. You can't just enjoy, you know, having this, this slice of cake whenever you want. You really have to have a strong willpower and uh, no one to say no. And if your friends are going out late, like, oh, sorry, I can't join you. I'm staying in so I can get, you know, a full day of training in tomorrow. I don't want to be, you know, tired the next day because training's priority to me. I want to feel my best and I want to know that I did everything possible when I step into uh, the ring, the, when I step into the octagon on October 4th. I want to know that I did everything possible in the camp to be at my physical peak. Speaking of friends, how uh, critical is it to you or how particular are you rather about the people you surround yourself with? 
I think it's extremely important who you, uh, your inner circle, who you surround yourself with. I think they, they affect you in a lot of different ways. So generally speaking, my, my friends are health conscious. You know, they're, they tend to eat very, very similar foods. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of just, you know, healthy individuals, you know, with the almond milk and uh, just eating like lots of lean meat, you know, nothing, nothing fatty. Like I haven't had, you know, fast food in over like two years or whatnot, like even longer than that. I can't even remember the last time I had fast food. So just having friends who kind of like live a similar lifestyle to you, like my, a lot of my friends are just active. They love the outdoors. So instead of just hanging out on the couch and all day and watching like, you know, eight episodes of uh, Orange is the New Black in a row or something. We uh, we go outside, we get outside, we stay active, and uh, we really move, tend to move around a lot. Jason, has your social life changed greatly since you become a professional fighter and, of course, gained your UFC contract? Um, No, because I still spend that time with uh, my girlfriend. The only thing that really changed is you just get recognized a little bit more, you know, just being uh walking around town and be like some you know you see people kind of giving you the second look and then they're like you look familiar or some people are like hey jay you know good luck training on your next fight so it's kind of mixed really depends where i'm hanging out if i'm hanging out at just like the general gym where people are working out and you get more people knowing about what i do and where i'm training but if them in the grocery store they just think that guy looks familiar maybe they saw him on like the the compass here on cbc on the island or stuff like that and are the hometown folks pretty supportive oh very supportive very supportive everyone on the island has been 100 percent behind me and they're you know with me all the way and uh i can feel that and it uh makes me motivated to train extra hard for this fight now, Jason, a moment ago I asked you about what you felt your greatest strength was. Uh, perhaps we could flip that around and do a little bit of soul searching. In terms of, uh, I don't like to use the term weakness, but let's replace that with opportunity mm -hmm. to improve or develop. What do you recognize right. as a professional fighter as that opportunity for you to improve and develop? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, areas that I'm, I'm trying to grow on, it's like every day I'm, I'm trying to get better at jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, wrestling, it's constant and never-ending improvement. Like, I'm always trying to be a better version of myself than I was the day before, and that involves me going in and training and putting the time in at the academy, working with my coaches, researching when I get home, looking at videos on the internet, seeing what the guys at the highest level, guys who are champions in the UFC, seeing what they're doing with their life, with their training routine, and trying to duplicate that. So yeah. I'm just basically trying to see people that have already had success and are currently successful and trying to duplicate their efforts. And do, would you say that the majority of your training is uh, actual conditioning, or is there, a, is there a certain amount of it that's strategic? Oh, for sure. Uh, my style is more like technician, so you never see me just like kind of throw recklessly. You can see I'm trying to pick somebody apart, right? I'm trying to analyze their game. I'm trying to see where their openings are. I'm never just rushing in and throwing punches, you know, like a wild person. I'm very calculated, calm and calculated, and just very persistent and a kind of a gradual pressure style. So uh, I definitely feel more of my strength is kind of breaking the opponent down and seeing what their game is and then you know analyzing and then attacking from there um not just rushing in there drawing the technique and hoping for the best i definitely uh more of a, a thinking kind of fighter than uh, just super uh, aggressive throwing out throwing punches out there and seeing what happens and jason since you've gotten your ufc contract and you're in the media a bit more and people are talking about you uh, probably at home and uh, both your homes you know where you came from originally and now where you're training mm -hmm. Uh, are you experiencing a fair amount of celebrityism? Are there uh, advances from people? Are there is there a lot of recognition? Um, no, like min you know, like a minimal amount. Like definitely more so than any other point in my life, I guess. You know, there's, it's nothing like too extreme. It's more it's just like, uh, hey, hello, how are you? I saw you in the newspaper, kind of thing. So it's nothing like too too over the top right now. Maybe eventually, if I just keep winning the fights and climb the ladder, I could see it getting a little bit more and more, but uh, it definitely, you know, it's not, it's not going to my head or anything like that. 
good for you. And for the benefit of myself and our listeners, you must have a lot of temptations in your line of work. I mean, one of them obviously is the diet, I would think would be something that can be very tempting at times to break off of. Uh, There might be other temptations as well. How do you deal with cravings and temptations? Um, Well, it definitely helps that my my partner, my girlfriend, Rachel, like, uh, again, leading a similar lifestyle, she enjoys eating healthy, and I enjoy eating healthy. So it's easy when... you're making meals for your partner or vice versa. She's making meals for you and you know, it's going to be healthy because that's what they want to eat. That's what you want to eat. So there's, it helps to, I guess, eliminate the temptation. So I know when she goes grocery shopping, she's not going down, I guess the candy aisle and buying like Hershey's kisses and stuff like that. She's going and buying broccoli, you know, spaghetti squash, uh, spinach, you know, and just healthy food overall. So the temptation is not there when I get home because the cover's not filled with sweets. That's and that's a good support to have. Oh yeah, hundred percent. You need to have somebody that supports what you do and they support your lifestyle. So it helps when I think with temptation when if it's not in front of you, well at least with me, if it's not directly in front of you, then I'm not even gonna be thinking about it. I'll be focused on the fight. But if you come home and there's like uh you know, I love uh carrot cake. If I see a big carrot cake I'll be like, uh oh, I really wanna eat that carrot cake so she knows to just make sure to make sure that there's healthy food in the house and she's making uh, healthy food and vice versa. I also make healthy meals as well. Sounds like a good plan. And not yeah, to put you yeah, on the, not to put you on the spot with my next question. So if, if you want we can come back to it. But uh, in terms of uh, you know the lar- the problems that you experience in your line of work. Uh, as a career fighter, what would you identify as possibly the largest problem that that career presents for you? Oh, one of the ones that concerns me is concussions. I mean, that's a big problem. Like, you know, I, I want to be able, once my career is over, to be able to remember the small things that my wife does or if my kid does something. You know, I want to remember those moments. And uh, I think concussions are not something that's uh, really talked about. So, uh, concussions are a big concern of mine and making sure that I'm training smart, that I'm not taking too much trauma to my head and that when we're sparring, we got the headgear on, we got thick headgear on, we got the big gloves and we're not, you know, just thrown to the fences. So that's why I'm happy to be from a technical school that is aware of that and that we are training smart and we're not just, you know, thrown to try to hurt our partner. We're actually concerned about our partner's health and we make sure that we're, we're training smart all the time. You are listening to my 2015 interview with USC fighter Jason Sago. This is Martial Arts World Radio. We shall return after this short break. Welcome back to Martial Arts World Radio and our 2015 interview with UFC lightweight fighter Jason Sago. Jason, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, Jason, your UFC contract, please tell us about that because that really is the NHL of MMA fighting. Please share with us how mm-hmm. that went down. My last fight was in June, so just about a uh, month before that, we were in discussions with my manager. Uh, he basically called me up one day and he said, I got some news for you. And, you know, I called him back uh, right after training and he let me know. He's like, there's an opportunity to fight in the UFC. Uh, you take it. I'm like, 100%, I'm there, you know, for sure. It's, uh, I think it's every. Uh, MMA fighters dream to be involved with the UFC because it's the fight at the highest level, right? It's uh, the number one slot. Like you were saying, it's the NHL of MMA. So, I mean, that's where I wanted to be, and I was very grateful to have the opportunity to compete in the UFC. How did you stay? Because as I understand it, you did uh, audition or try out or appeal to the UFC about the Ultimate Fighter television program. So how did you stay on mm-hmm. the UFC's radar? Was your manager responsible for that, or are you constantly doing self That's right. Uh, so I flew to Toronto to try out for the Ultimate Fighter Canada versus Australia, and I think that helped definitely put my name out there. And uh, I think Joe Silva saw me because it was live trial, so we had like you know we had to grapple, we had to hit the pads, and they were watching us. And then we also did interviews on camera and stuff like that so they could see that uh my skills were up there and uh i think they I kind of left an impression on them and i was very close to making the show i think i was in like you know the top five guys that they had to decide so i was very very close to making the show and they just decided i guess it was a better uh suit with some other fighters but i think that left enough of an impression on them to 
invite me back again to uh, to compete in the UFC in Vancouver. Jason, I'd like to zero in for a moment on that experience. So you're trying out for the ultimate fighter. You know that you're probably in the top five. You know you've got their attention. How do you deal with mm. the anticipatory nausea of not, you know, not getting your hopes up too quickly before you knew? I mean, that must have been an emotional roller coaster ride. It was because you don't know, right? And you're trying to prepare your life because you don't know if you're going to be spending six weeks away locked in a mansion with these other 16 fighters and you have no communication with the outside world and you don't know if it's going to happen or not. So, yeah, there's a lot of kind of uh, stress generated towards that. But uh, I think it actually ended up working out better for me in the end because I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to leave my partner for, you know, those six weeks. And uh, I was able to stay at home and focus on my training. And I still got to... UFC, which is where I wanted to be in the end anyway, so I think it ended up working out well for me. Now, something I'm popular is saying on this show, uh, I quote Dr. Wayne Dyer, who says, no matter where you've been and no matter what's happened to you, you had to have been there in order for you to be where you are now. Exactly. However, it, it, mm -hmm, that, that makes so sense to me. You know, maybe it was just, it wasn't the right timing in my life to go away in that house for six weeks, but my goal and what I had on my dream board was always to, you know, be in the UFC. I had UFC up there for a long time, so I didn't know how it was going to happen. I didn't know when it was going to happen, but I just worked every day towards that goal, and thankfully, it, it did happen, and it actually happened, like, less than two months after the, the show, so it was actually relatively quick. That is relatively quick, and I think that really speaks volumes for how they must have felt about you um, mm -hmm. through the process of selecting you and then deciding not to take you on with the ultimate fighter, they must have thought, had you sitting in the back of their minds saying, we got to pick this right. guy up. Yeah, that's what I think too. Jason, not to dwell on the negative, but I think this is a really important mm -hmm. aspect of your story. How much, what was the level of disappointment when you found out you were not selected for the ultimate fighter? I, initially, at first, I was fairly disappointed because I kind of had my hopes because I knew that would lead me into being in the UFC so I kind of thought that was the door that was the opportunity that's where I was supposed to be and that's where I thought that was okay that's going to lead me to my goal of being in the UFC and then when they told me you know got down to the final five and I didn't make the cut I was a little yeah I was a little devastated and I was uh, you know sad but I still just got back on you know the grind and I was just like all right time to get to work time to go back to work you know I didn't really let it affect me I'm just like you know I know what I have to do to make it to the top and I just stuck with my game plan of going back to the academy every day and training and putting the time in and I knew I was gonna I had belief that I was gonna get there eventually and I just stuck with my belief and I did good for you I think that's a good lesson for all of us that discouraging moments do happen but it doesn't sound like you dwelled on it and it does not sound like you let yep. it weaken you from your pursuit of your ultimate goal to be in the UFC I say, don't, yeah don't let those discouraging moments phase you you know if it's in your heart and if it's your passion you just keep following that and give it 100 percent speaking of ultimate goals your long-term vision have you got your sights set on the uh, lightweight world champion for the UFC <laughs> That's a good question. It's like I had it on, on my dream board for so long about being in the UFC, and then when it finally happened, it's like, oh, you know, goal achieved. And then now it's at that point in my life where it's time to reevaluate. It's time to figure out what's the next step. So I, I haven't quite reevaluated. I've just been focusing on this fight and being in the best possible shape for this fight. And eventually, I think after this fight, I'm going to have to go out there and uh, set another goal and I'm not I'm not exactly sure what that what that's going to be yet you know I'm going to talk it over with with my partner and maybe it will be to be the number one lightweight fighter in the world you know I'll have to see and evaluate what I what I want out of life and because with that if you decide to make that that decision you have to be prepared to make the sacrifices and it's not just like oh I want to be champion there's so many sacrifices you have to make in life you have to sacrifice time with your family time with your friends Mm -hmm. and I, it has to be a sacrifice that you're willing to make. Now, I think I believe when I was go doing some research for the show tonight, I caught, uh, you've got a great web presence, and I caught uh, some of your statements on the web, and um, I believe one of the statements that jumped out at me was where you remarked that it's all about that one night, that everything that you're training towards is about that one fight, that one night. Is that how you're dealing with it right now? You're just taking it one fight at a time? Yeah, I think that's a good way to deal with it too because 
fighting is like and competing with martial arts is like the highest of highs and like the lowest of lows so if you win your fight it's like you're on top of the world you're the best everyone sends you messages of positivity and congratulations and this and that you know and you feel like a million bucks but then when you lose you don't get the messages you feel like you know you're just down on yourself you're disappointed in your performance so it's the highest of highs and like the lowest of lows so it, you got to be prepared for that you have to be mentally strong and you have to be mentally strong to come back after a loss so that's one of the hardest things I'm glad you brought that up and I really think this is important not just for a fighter but I think it's important for all of us but I, I'd like to talk a little bit to that so let me set up some context here uh, I am a follower of the MMA. I'm a martial artist myself, and I have a real appreciation and respect for the sport. I also like to watch boxing and, and other competitive sports, but MMA in particular. Now, cool. there are times where I see fighters train, and I see the tail of the tape, or I see the preliminary you know, bios that they do and the hype they build up, and it seems that the fighters are getting themselves mentally prepared to win that fight. Um, a loss right. is not an option. It's not even something they want to think about. They want to fixate on the belt. They uh -huh. visualize and all of that. Now, I mm -hmm. suspect that there are some fighters who, as part of that psychological conditioning, do not prepare themselves whatsoever for a loss. And then when they do loss, when they, in the event they do lose, they're completely unprepared emotionally and psychologically right. to deal with it. And what you right. just brought up is that you seem to feel that you do have to be prepared for any option because anybody can win, anybody can win a fight and anybody can lose a fight, correct? Yeah, M MMA is a very unforgiving sport, so it takes one mistake. If you make one mistake, you could be knocked out, you could be submitted, and it's easy to do. I mean, we're humans; people make mistakes all the time. So if you make one mistake, it could be over. So I think yeah, it's very important that you're prepared for that loss and that even financially too like you can't expect to win that bonus money if you, if you win you get a fight purse right and then if, if you you get paid to fight and then you also get a win bonus if you win your fight so you, you got to be financially prepared too what if you don't get that win bonus you know and that extra money isn't there so it's like being mentally prepared being financially prepared you have to be ready to, to go either way and you have to again be, be ready to just whatever happens you know this is your passion you're going to follow it through you know and just just being 100% behind the the outcome, whether win or, win or lose, you know, you gotta, for me, it's like I don't put so much pressure on I have to win the fight, I have to win the fight. It's more of like, have I done everything in my power to prepare for this fight? Have I achieved, you know, peak physical condition? Have I been mentally training? I've been doing the visualization exercises. Like, have I done everything possible? And if I have, then I, I should be proud. And then I go into the fight feeling confident and ready because I know I've done everything in my power and I'm ready for that moment. Now, this might be a very tough question to answer. I, I know it would be difficult for me to articulate this, but I must ask it. How do you emotionally prepare yourself for a possible loss without betraying the psychological conditioning of being determined to win right that's that's a good question and it's kind of like same thing in life like i don't focus too much on the negative so i definitely spend a lot more time focusing on the positive outcome of the fight and uh, prepping myself like when i'm doing visualization it's usually with me getting the upper hand on stuff so but uh, to prepare for the loss it's about kind of taking a little bit of pressure off pressure off of yourself and saying you know winning isn't everything winning isn't your life like if you win win the fight or you lose the fight you know is your partner going to love you the same yes are your true friends going to be around yes they're going to be around they don't care whether you win or lose it's people that i know i guess try to associate your success with them those people they'll only be around when you win but they're not even really like you know true friends they're not really there for you they're just there for themselves so it's kind of just realizing that win or lose everything's going to be okay you know life goes on it's, it's not the, the end of the world it's not the end of the world indeed and your current training regime can you describe what a typical day is like for you um training from usually from 9 to 11:30 uh, in the morning and then um in the afternoons i usually go into the academy at 4:30 and i'm there to about 9:30 at night and that's a mix of my own training and teaching so it's and is that uh, 7 days a week no cuz it's important that you have your day of rest 
so your body's like a machine, right? If you keep, you know, driving the machine and you you keep on, just, you know, destroying it, destroying it, because all, all we're doing is we're punishing our body when we're training. Your your muscles are getting ripped up. You're getting tweaked. Your body's getting contorted. So if you do that seven days a week, you will be destroyed. You won't make it through two weeks of your training camp. So I think having the one day of a full rest and recovery where, you know, you have like an Epsom salt bath, you let the muscles relax, you let your just your body rejuvenate and just replenish itself. I think that's really important to have that one full day of rest. Jason, uh, a few weeks ago, we had an interview with uh, Elias Theodorou. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, I know Elias. He's a funny guy. <laughs> and uh, and actually, I was speaking to Elias, and he mentioned that he knew you as well, and and uh, definitely it seems there's a mutual respect there. Yeah, definitely. He's a really solid dude. Uh, I, I think he's. He's got the skills. Uh, he won. He won the Ultimate Fighter. He he's great on TV. He's a personality, right? So I think he's he's great for the sport. He's 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 kind of got all the characteristics to be successful. You know, during that show, one of the questions that I asked Elias is, I said, "What sacrifices are you willing to make for the sport?" And I clarified for him. I said, "You know, you're a good-looking guy. You've got a really good screen presence. You've got, like you just mentioned, Jason. I said to him, you're you're very charismatic on the television. Yep. And I said, you're you're in a uh, a profession where people get beat up. They get cauliflower ears. Right. And and I said, so I, I I hear that you're a hard worker and you're making all of these sacrifices for training. But just how far are you willing to go in terms of the personal sacrifices for this career? And his answer to me was. As far as I'm concerned, the body is just a vessel. I'm willing to give this career whatever it requires, whatever it takes. So I'd like to propose the same question to you, Jason. You know, in terms of personal sacrifices, how far are you willing to go for this career? Um, I probably wouldn't take the exact same stance as Elias, just because I believe for me, health is the number one priority. So if I'm kind of fighting and I near the end of the career, let's say I keep on getting knocked out. I'm not going to keep fighting if I feel my health is at risk. Like I said earlier before in the interview, I want to be able to remember uh, my kids and my, you know, my wife. And if you're looking at anything you do with head trauma, I think uh, people should look at it a little bit more seriously because this is stuff that's going to affect you after your career is over. So you can live in the limelight, the limelight for five to ten years, but what about afterwards? What about when your career is over? How does it affect your relationship with your friends, your family? Um, are you going to have slurred speech? I think that's uh, serious to consideration. Like, you should really look into that. Yeah, those are all very good points, and uh, I'm glad that you brought that up. And that is a very interesting stance because I think all too often the uneducated viewer uh, or the, the general public who doesn't necessarily educate themselves on MMA – uh, who look at this as just a human cockfight, I don't think that they realize that these are considerations that are important to the fighters themselves. Oh, very much so, very much so. And that's why it's like we everyone here has a limited time in the sport, so you better make the most of it. If you're only here for the next five years, you better make the, those five years like the highlight. You know, of your your entire career, you got to give it your all. So that's what I'm going to do. You know, I know I'm not, I'm not going to be involved with the sport for more than 10, 10 years in terms of being a competitor, but let's say i got five solid years. I'm going to make the most out of those five solid years, and if it comes to the point where – you know, I'm not able to compete uh, at the highest level and uh, my health is suffering, maybe I'm going through uh, concussion or concussion symptoms, then I'm going to know when it's time to, to call it quits. Jason, can you tell us a little bit about your early days? Where did you grow up? What were some of the things that uh, caught your interest as a child? Maybe give us a little bit of background. I grew up in a really small town of Caledon, Ontario, or Bolton, Ontario, uh, just really small small place everyone knew everybody um just uh just a quiet quiet life you know like uh, not not too much just typical i guess uh teenager things you know like i think actually what happened when i was younger was like i used to like around when i was like 12 13 years old it's like I used to drink like too much, you know, like go out and party and stuff like that. And I think eventually I just got like sick of it. I had so much alcohol in my system. I'm just like, this is horrible. I never want to feel like this again. And that's why, you know, I, I completely stopped drinking. Like I don't drink alcohol at all anymore. And I think it's because when I was younger, I did it like way too much. And I think that really turned me off. So 
I think that's one of the reasons that uh, helped me focus now today is just because I'm just avoiding all that. I, I don't really go out and party. I don't want to be part of that scene. I don't want to be drinking alcohol and feeling like, you know, crap the next day. So in that, in that way, it, it benefited me. Yeah, I would presume that uh, when you're training, alcohol would really diminish your gains. Yeah, it, it definitely, like, I mean, from what I see from my training partners that do drink, I know they're not the same when they go out after a night of partying and they're up till 2 a.m. drinking, doing shots. Like, I can tell them, like, yeah, you were out last night because you're a step behind today. And why martial arts? What was it that interested you in the first place? I've always been interested in martial arts my whole life, but I think uh, when I was in university, um, just messing around on the heavy bag one day, and my friend said, hey, why don't you come out to this class? And it was just like a karate Muay Thai class, and I was hooked after I did that one class. So I just knew. I just knew it was my passion. I, just, I knew it was what I loved and what I wanted to do the rest of my life. And how long have you been a martial artist? Since like well, 20, 20, 21 years old, so relatively new. And you attended the University of Guelph. What program were you involved in? Originally, I was in computer science, and then I switched over to uh, studying philosophy and psychology. Oh, very interesting. And from my uh, philosophical side, or in, in respect to that consideration, would you consider yourself uh, a follower of different philosophies, or even is there a spiritual side to Jason Sago? <laughs> spiritual side. That's a good question. You know, my philosophy is just to be open, you know, don't be so closed off and so closed minded. That's what I really enjoy about traveling is because you get to go to different cultures and hear other people's perspective and to know, you know, for example, you know, going, growing up here in uh, Ontario, it was, uh, you know, Christianity. And then to go to a place like Thailand where the primary religion is Buddhism and to hear just different life philosophies. I think it's really important to go out there and, uh, just see what the world has to offer you know sometimes you have to leave your comfort zone you have to leave your your current environment and see what else is out there and i think a lot of people would be really surprised that oh like wow i can't believe these people have this perspective and it's so different from my own it's it's not who's right or wrong it's just figuring out what what, what works for you and, you know, that's a very interesting statement you just made, that you have to leave your comfort level. I, I'm a firm believer mm -hmm. that there is no growth without discomfort, that we must be challenging that's ourselves right. and, and going beyond our comfort level in order to grow. Uh, and, of course, there's a distinction in today's world between spirituality, religion. And so having traveled mm -hmm. the world, you've probably seen some pretty interesting sights. Is there anything in particular from your travels that stands out as a story you wish to share? Um, I guess just like what surprised me most about my travels was uh, just the good nature of humans. You know, like I see people here in the West who have so much, they have all these material possessions, but yet they don't want to share anything. You know, it's like it's all theirs and it's all about their ego and this is mine and how dare they even, you know, approach me and stuff like that. It's just a lot of attitude I find over here, but I find when I was, traveling like in vietnam and thailand like people would have nothing like these families it would be like a whole family like just five six people living in like this one bedroom place just on like stilts and they had nothing but they would invite me in to have a meal and they barely had enough food to feed mm -hmm. their own, own family so it's just like incredible difference just in mentality and their willingness and openness to share versus i find sometimes over here we're some people can be really closed off and just a little bit greedy and egotistical and uh, not saying that everyone is, but it's just, I've noticed that, 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 that big difference and uh, that really traveling, you know, throughout all my years of school and going to university, I learned more traveling and being on the road and interacting with people from different cultures than I ever did through, you know, tr through traditional school. So I, I would really encourage everyone and anyone to go out there and, and travel and to leave your comfort zone and to, just be open-minded and to try to hear somebody else's perspective and to hear their beliefs and their values. You have been listening to an interview with UFC mixed martial artist, Jason Sago. This is Martial Arts World Radio, and I'm your host, Joseph Clark. Last year, I had a discussion with martial arts cinema star, Bolo Jung. Bolo is most easily recognized as Jean-Claude Van Damme's opponent in the movie Bloodsport. 
and as the big and muscular bodybuilder in Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. He was a professional champion bodybuilder and starred in numerous martial art films around the world. Bolo began various kung fu styles at age of 10. Today he's recognized as one of martial arts international stars. He also was a close friend to Bruce Lee. His feedback to me was as follows. After 1973, there was a change in martial arts. It seemed to change, it seems to change every 15 years. There is a straight line and a bisecting cross line to martial arts. The straight line being efficient, practical, application. The cross line being performance martial arts, choreography. The movies have had a huge change since the 70s. When an object raises to the top, it will eventually go to the bottom and rise back up again. It is the same concept with martial art movies. What comes around goes around. Bolo said, in the old days, they did 18 takes in a film, no editing, one shot nonstop. Now with digital technology, the fight scene is synchronized, more in editing, less choreography. Action directors are not usually martial artists. They are chasing schedules and piecing scenes together. Very interesting perspectives from an accomplished Kung Fu practitioner and inter international star, Bolo Young. Along that same line, I interviewed Kung Fu Grandmaster Sifu Mo Chow, a pioneer in the Kung Fu community. He established his own Kung Fu club and is one of the first Kung Fu stylists to compete in open karate martial arts championships, capturing numerous first place finishes. He's also a pioneer in the martial arts cinema business, and he has appeared in numerous martial arts films and was an integral part of the television series Kung Fu The Legend Continues with David Carradine. Sifu Mo Chao's feedback was, martial artists today are for the most part made up of improved, sophisticated, dedicated individuals. I have not adapted my style, he says. I've stayed pure as an instructor. Adaptation applies more to tournament fighters. In cinema today, Chinese arts are more relevant than ever. Mo Chao stated, most stunt coordinators learn Chinese arts. It's beautiful, it's beauty, it's impressive on the big screen and therefore it has become more predominant in the choreography. The reason you do not see Kung Fu stylists in the UFC, he stated, is that MMA is straightforward, knock them out. Anything goes. MMA is made up of basic rudimentary techniques, no finesse. Mo Chao's prediction for the future is that every style is getting combined. Martial arts is becoming more and more nonpartisan. There will be less and less purity of styles. Martial arts schools are becoming a melting pot. It's a good thing, he says. For future generations, Mo Chao hopes that they will be true to themselves and be loyal to the roots of their art. Respect it. Give credit where it's due. He started competing over 45 years ago. However, he states, I don't dwell on the past. I reflect, but I look forward. I encourage martial artists to expand their knowledge. Don't get stuck in one spot. Always evolve. Keep developing. Modern Wisdom from Sifu Mo Chao. Coming up next, Mark Hepsher, Canadian network broadcaster on his experiences interviewing boxing greats such as Muhammad Ali, Roberto Durant, and many more. You're listening to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm your host, Joseph Clark. Welcome back to our number two of Martial Arts World Radio. I'm your host, Joseph Clark. Mark Hepsher is a Canadian broadcaster with a diverse career experience, which includes network television, sports specialty channels, radio, print, and online streaming. Throughout his career, he has interviewed legendary professional athletes, including world-class champion boxers. Mark, welcome to our show. Joseph, nice speaking with you, as always. As always, likewise. Now, Mark, in a moment, I would like to ask you about your interviews with Boxing Greatest. However, tell us about your podcast, No Fun Intended. 
Yeah, uh, I was working for 13 years at CHCH TV in Hamilton, and uh, the company uh, declared bankruptcy and put a bunch of us out of work. I'd been doing a current affairs show there called Square Off with Liz West, uh, and I was also doing a show called Sportsline, which was a different version of um, a show that I had helped um, make popular on global TV in the 80s and 90s. Uh, so when I lost my job in uh, Hamilton, um, it took about three or four days before I figured out that, you know, I still would like to broadcast. Um, and podcasting was an interesting option. Um, so I called my partner, Liz West, who was my host on the show, that was more of a, cur- like, again, more of an interview current affairs show. Sure. Uh, and I said, let's do a podcast. So we, we have, and we've done over 100 of them now. Um, you know, a couple times a week, three times a week even, <clears throat> we'll release new shows. And basically, it's like a lifestyle show, I guess, like it would be like any radio show, except it's a podcast. So, you know, normally with podcasts, it's a more of a specialized thing. If you're a tech geek, you listen to a tech podcast. If you're a sports nut, you'll listen to a sports podcast. If you're a martial arts fan or a fight fan, you might also listen, besides this show, to a podcast or a podcast version of this. So it's broadcasting. You know, there's a few, you know, nuances, different things than, you know, radio broadcasting, which is over the air and live. A podcast stays on forever. And any, any commercial you do or anything you have in it is embedded forever in the podcast. People can listen to it, could listen to it uh, years from now. So we got into that, and it's fun. It's very interesting. It's creative. It's harder because you have to be your own producer and you have to be your own financial person and, uh, you know, creative director and you're in a partnership. Liz and I are doing a partnership, so we're learning about business as well, but it's very exciting. So I'm doing that, plus I'm also doing some writing on the side and some documentary and, you know, as a broadcaster who is out, out of work when it comes to having a regular employment, you've got to sort of reinvent yourself sometimes. You've got to do certain things that, you know, maybe you haven't done in a while and sharpen your skills and, um, I'm, I'm a pretty accomplished broadcaster, so I'm doing what I like. And, um, you know, always got your eyes open. Never know. And the opportunities open up. They really do. They, they, they just, they do happen. As long yeah, as you're open I mean, a them. lot of it is timing. <clears throat> and a lot of it is, you know, is creating your own as well. It, I'm not, it's not like I'm a kid and I'm looking for my first job in broadcasting, right? It's, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I've been doing a lot of things for a lot of years, and I've made some contacts. But at the same time, you know, broadcasting in general is changing, you know, and um, you have to be able to change with it. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't embrace the technology or the, <clears throat> you know, just the progress, uh, and uh, you remain back in the 80s or 90s, which a lot of people still do, don't get me wrong, um, but yeah, you've got to, you know, weigh that balance. What you have to know, you have to know your audience, Joseph. You've got to know you know your audience, and uh, what their likes and dislikes are. And the advertisers, of course, want to know, you know, what demographic they're in, and you know, will they buy our my product? Will they pay for my service? Will they come and you know, for if they need heating and air conditioning or whatever it is? So that's a key part of. Um, broadcasting much more so now where it used to be we like listening to great radio now there's more to it now there has to be more of a benefit for the sponsor because everyone's fighting for that sponsor's dollar so it's very different and when you're in it as a business person as opposed to just a an employee of a big company um, it's a totally different outlook but it's you know what i'm learning a lot about a lot of things no fun intended where does one find the podcast right no pun intended so you just go to itunes um, or go to podcasts on your phone, on your device. And um, there's very, I mean, you know, basically what you do is you subscribe to it or you can go right to our website, which is nofunintendedpodcast.com, <clears throat> and you can hear all of the episodes. Not at once, of course. That would be crazy. Who would want to do that? But we've, we've got them all archived. And, you know, um, like it runs the gamut. Like we've had lots of special guests and music, but generally we talk about the things that interest us a lot of the issues that, you know, you talk to with your friends, you know, water cooler talk or just current events, interesting stuff. So and that's, that's no fun as F-U-N, not pun. F-U-N. That's right. That's right. No fun. As opposed intended. to no pun intended. Right. It's right. no fun intended. Yeah. A- Apple podcast. Right. Uh, I- uh, iTunes. iTunes. Yep. Terrific. Um, 
you can get it uh, via your uh, device. Like I said, there's always there's a podcast icon on most devices on most phones. So I'm told. <laughs> now, Mark, I'm learning it as well. I'm learning it as well. Once you once you're a podcast listener, you get it. And until you're a podcast listener, you don't understand it. I was the same way. Please walk through the stations and networks which you've worked for throughout your impressive career, because you've you've actually had some, a very interesting career in Canadian broadcasting. So share with us the stations that were uh, part of your journey. Well, I started in uh, Kitchener. Uh, I worked for CKKW Radio, uh, the FM affiliate, which was CFCA, and the television station, Channel 13. Kitchener was owned by Electra Home Broadcasting. So this is when I was going to college at Conestoga College in, uh, in beautiful Kitchener and hanging out with lots of people from, you know, Blue Water Country. I mean, a lot of folks from Owen Sound, Collingwood, Hanover, Kincardin, you know, um, oh, man, Listowel, Mild May. <laughs> Durham, uh, Flesherton, yeah, just um, a lot of folks, a lot of uh, people from that, um, you know, part of uh, Ontario sure. <clears throat> went to Conestoga College in the 70s. When, and if they didn't go there, they went to um, Wilfrid Laurier University, which is now, which was at the time known as Waterloo Lutheran University, the WLU and uh, Waterloo. So, uh, yeah, it was a real college town, a real university town, so... I worked there in radio and uh, TV and got my feet wet, learned everything, learned how to shoot a camera, learned how to edit film, learned how to be a broadcaster, learned how to rip wire copy and, uh, and read the news and climb up the transmitter and change the pattern in the evening and, oh, man, everything. I was on the air the night Elvis Presley died. I ran down to the record library and I grabbed every wow. single Elvis album Songs I, you know, some songs I knew, of course, a lot of them, but a lot I'd never heard before, and just started throwing stuff on. <laughs> the, the, it was great. The day that everybody remembers where they were when they heard Elvis. Well, I don't know if they do or not. Um, K, probably JFK it's one of those. Assassinated. Yeah, probably one of those kind of moments. But I know I was on the history. air, August 16th, 1977. So I did that, um, and then I, um, and then I got a job in uh, Niagara Falls, Ontario in the winter time, which was not a good place to work in the middle of winter in February, January and February, happened to be the blizzard of 1977. So um, that wasn't a lot of fun, but it got, some, got my feet wet there. And then I started working in Toronto. I worked for the precursor to the fan, which was CKFH in Toronto. It was owned by Foster Hewitt, the legendary hockey announcer. And yep. he had the Blue Jays, Blue Jays broadcast when they first started, and then the Maple Leafs game. So it was a sports station, even though they played country music when I was there. They had a lot of sports casts and a lot of sports shows, and sure. Bob McCowan's show was on that station, and I was Bob McCowan's first producer on radio. So that's how I learned the sports talk broadcast business from Bob McCowan. Uh, and, uh, I was, and then became a sportscaster and I took a job in Montreal, which was very interesting for me on an FM station there, and I was the first FM broadcaster to get a, a press accreditation for the Montreal Expos and the Montreal Canadiens. They would not allow FM broadcasters uh, accreditation at the time. They didn't think they were worthy. <laughs> so, Mark, your your career really did start out more on radio than it did on television. I would, it, Absolutely. It I in wasn't television. in television. I, I had a couple more radio jobs before I started in TV, right? And then uh, which network stations were you working for, uh, television stations? Well, Global wasn't a, Global TV wasn't a network. It was, just, it was all over Ontario, and you could get it on satellite all over the world on the Anik D2 satellite. Okay. But um, in our minds, in mine and Jim Taddy's mind, it was a network because we reached more people than anybody, we thought, even though it was only Ontario. We knew that people from out west could get us on an affiliate station. And, in fact, the affiliate stations um, started doing a similar version of Sportsline, their own local version. Vancouver had one. Winnipeg had one. Sure. Calgary yeah. had one. Uh, Edmonton had one. They all did. Uh, um, Regina, every other city um, outside of Ontario had its own version of Sportsline once ours became popular. And that show was on for 11. I was on that show for 11 years. That's a long run. 19, 1984 to 1995. And we revolutionized the way uh, television did sports highlights. And, you know, not so much the telling of the stories, but the highlights and the excitement and the energy of, you know, doing highlights and just having fun and putting together 30 minutes every night when nobody else was doing it. 
that was uh, that was um, pretty exciting stuff. But eleven years, you know, you got to move on. Sometimes you you know, I had a, starting a family, and uh, late nights were killing me after a while, especially when you've got young kids. And I just you know, you want to change sometimes, right? I think I've gone as far as I did, so I took a job back in radio, doing uh, play by play of the Toronto Argonauts and. Uh, what I thought was play-by-play -play of the Toronto Maple Leafs as well. Uh, later, they changed that job on me, which I didn't like at all, and, and uh, was pretty upset about. It. I wanted to, I wanted to do play-by-play -play of the Maple Leafs. I thought that was a plum job. Radio, TV sure. didn't matter. But I wanted to do it, and I had a shot at it, and I, I got it, and, and then they took it away from me. So that was a pretty bitter pill to swallow. So um, did that in radio. Went back to television. Worked for the Score which was called Headline Sports at the time, which is now Sportsnet 3. I remember that. Which was pretty bare-bones stuff, but it was interesting. It was a departure from what I'd done before in sports broadcasting. And then I started at Sportsnet when it was owned by CTV. I was there for a year, but I didn't like it because I was doing the 6.30 sportscast. Um, and it was just an early evening sportscast, so there are no highlights, right? I mean, if there was a day baseball game, we'd have highlights, but rarely did we have any fresh highlights at 6.30 you know, at night. So that was a the shift. Night before, by, by the night, you know, the night before stuff was old by then. Sure. So it wasn't really for me, and I had to do four versions of it. I had to do one for Eastern Canada. I had to do one for Ontario. I had to do one for Western Canada, and I had to do one for B.C. So I would pretty much do the same show over and over again four times every night, except the lead story would be a different story. It would be more suited to that local, the, the region I was doing it. Yeah, yeah, and you have to right. So the east, I would do a Canadian story. Or, yeah, in the east region, you do a Montreal story, right? In the Ontario region, you do a Toronto or an Ottawa story, usually Toronto. It, the tough one was the west region because is it Winnipeg? Is it Regina? Is it Calgary, Edmonton? There was always a fight over that, and of course, in the BC in the Pacific, it was Vancouver. But that got to be a real, you know, it wasn't a lot of fun. So, Mark, it that, it wasn't, it wasn't that enjoyable. Let's talk interviews. You have got an incredibly impressive list here of champion fighters that you interviewed through your career. Let's begin with Muhammad Ali. Please share that experience with us. Yeah, actually, I'll tell you what. I never met – the first time I met Muhammad Ali, I was disappointed. I was disappointed because I was there on a press kind of junket thing. And, um, you know, we all had a chance to ask him questions. It was before his fight with Larry Holmes. He really wasn't in the mood. But I had spoken to him on a few occasions prior to that, because like I had mentioned, I was the producer of Bob McCowan's radio show. And Bob would have Muhammad Ali on the show occasionally. And I had his number. And I would call him at his home in Michigan. This is, of course, when he wasn't training for a fight. Sure. And, you know, we'd make arrangements, and he'd come on the show, and he would talk to Bob. This is 1977. So, hey, Muhammad. Hey, Mark. Hey, like that. And... It's, it's funny because I, I sort of just thought of it like I had forgotten some of the people I had spoken to on the phone and never really met. And so I didn't meet Ali till a few years later, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't one of those, hey, remember me from the radio in Toronto back in the, you know, 77? How, so, when you um, met him in person, cool. how really, far in his career was he at that point? Well, 77, he was, uh, he, had just, he had just lost to Spinks. And then, no, that was 78. So it was before he fought Spink. So he was the champ. He was the champ in 77, I guess it was. Yeah, he, who did he beat? Ken Norton? I'm trying to think here now. Foreman he beat in 75. Anyway, that's good. you've got me now. But in that 77, 78 time period, he was the champ, lost it, and then won it back from Spinks. That's when we knew him. Joe so Frazier. He was pretty cool. He was a pretty cool guy. So twice he fought Spinks twice in 78. So we knew him then. He, you know, we were... Like I say, when he was in heavy training, he would never speak to us, but you know, he'd come on and shoot the breeze for 10 or 15 minutes. And he was a cool guy. And remember, there weren't a lot of radio phone-in shows back in those days in sports one, so it's not like people are dying to get to Muhammad Ali and talk to him on the phone. He was more than willing to talk to anybody. And just because he didn't have a fight and there were no newspaper men around to get quotes from him didn't mean he didn't like talking. So tell us about your interview with Joe Frazier. Well, Frazier and I got sat, we got hooked up together for the Sugar Ray Leonard Roberto Duran fight in Montreal. This was in June of 1980 at the Montreal's Olympic Stadium. And it rained that night, and they had a big cover over top of the ring, but every, like half the people got soaked. Uh, 
<laughs> and anyway, so Frazier was in town, uh, and he was doing, he and I were doing the fight on um, radio. We were doing a radio, the radio version of the fight, so we're ringside. So it was great, you know. Hey, Mark Hepsher was smoking Joe Frazier ringside at Montreal's Olympic Stadium. Um, and we had also done the preliminary fights, and one of which, the preliminary fights, was a guy named Gaetan Hart, who fought a young kid named Cleveland Denny. And he punched him, and he, and he punched him so hard, he hit him so hard uh, several times that Denny was unconscious before he even hit the canvas. Uh, and everyone at ringside, Joe was the worst, or the loudest, yelling, stop the fight, stop the fight, because this guy Hart was just pummeling him. And uh, he later died, Cleveland Denny later died, I think the next day. Uh, in, uh, he never regained consciousness, 22 years old. And there Sad, was a big avoidable. investigation as to, you know, whether the ref should have stopped the fight and, you know, the athletic commission, the boxing commission was called, and it was a whole big deal. But that was, that was prior, uh, that was two or three fights in, in the undercard prior to Leonard Duran. So a lot of it was sort of forgotten in the thrill of the Leonard Duran fight, which, um, you know, which Duran won, which was spectacular. So Frazier, I'm doing the play by the blow by blow, and Frazier's doing the color. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> he was fabulous. What an opportunity. Oh, yeah, and he was Quite so nice. nice. He was such a nice guy. And I told him, I said I'd seen his, I'd actually seen him in his band play, Joe Frazier and the Knockouts. I'd seen them play when we were in Philadelphia the year before doing a hockey game, uh, Habs against uh, the Flyers. And we went and saw Joe Frazier's uh, band. It was like a quartet, and they played. Uh, he was a, like a singer. He was great. So he liked that. He was really nice. I really, really enjoyed my, uh, that evening with him, and I never, I never saw him after that. Sounds like a class act. Now, which yeah, Duran did you interview? Which Durant? Uh, so Roberto Durant, Duran was, at the time, he was already the lightweight champion. And I believe, yeah, and he was going for the welterweight title. Uh, and Leonard, so it was Duran, Hearns, Leonard, Wilfredo Benitez at the time. It was a fabulous welterweight. Was the best. Tommy Hearns was the best class. Hagler came later, and he was a middleweight. But anyway, so Duran fought Leonard in Montreal. Duran spoke no English at all, or he didn't want to speak English. And he had a gun in a holster. So when you went to interview him in his hotel room, he's a guy sitting in an undershirt with a gun. You know, it's in the holster, but still, you know, you think at any time, if he doesn't like the question you ask him or whatever, he's going to pull the gun on it, you. It's strapped to him. The gun's strapped to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's strapped <laughs> That's to a little intimidating. It's in a holster. And he's just, you know, he's like bored, I guess. It's, you know, the fight's not for another day or so, and they've already had the weigh-in, and, you know, it's media, and he's, he's got an interpreter there, and he was kind of bored by, by the whole thing. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was all business, let's put it that way, and it showed during the fight, too. He was relentless in that fight. All he business. never stopped coming at Leonard. It was fabulous. Sugar Ray Leonard. So, you interviewed and Leonard. And Leonard was everything you thought he was and more. He was great. He was gracious. He was funny. He, was, he remembered your name. He really engaged. He looked you in the eye. You know, he was, uh, how could you not like him? He was a very likable guy. Charismatic and larger than life. Yeah, yeah. He was everything. You know, you know the Olympics in 76, the world got to know Sugar Ray Leonard. I mean, he was, he was beautiful. You know, what a handsome fella, you know, doing commercials and all that. So he was, a, and in 1980, he was just a star, superstar. Mark, you shared with me that you had interviewed Lennox Lewis. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Tell us, where was that? Lennox Lewis? Yeah. Well, before I ever interviewed him, I knew him. I knew him socially. Uh, we had a mutual friend, and we had, uh, we had played pool many times together, billiards many times together. So I knew who he was. Uh, I knew him when he was a champion, before he was a champion in the 90s. And uh, he was sort of, I won't say he was a guy from the neighborhood, per se, but he was a guy that I knew, a circle of friends, and we knew of each other, and that's so sort of a mutual respect thing. So when I, the actual first time I interviewed him was a short clip, but recently, I guess this past March, we had him and George Chevallo on our podcast, and he was great, just a great storyteller. He's got all his marbles, right? He's very quick. He's clever. Um, you know, I don't know how many times he got hit in the head. I mean, he's a big guy. You know, I mean, he got knocked out a few times, but he seems to not have any ill effects, let's put it that way, uh, and very engaging guy. Um, and, yeah, answers your questions directly. Um, just, a, just a good guy. 
What a great conversation. Mark, George Shavalo. is he everything that people think he is? Because he just comes across to me as a real class act, a real gentleman, and yet there's a vulnerability to the guy. Tell me about George Shavalo. George Shavalo is, uh, I would say, without a doubt, and this is no lie, the, the guy who got the worst breaks in life yet um, does, is doing more for people now to help them so that they don't go through what he and his family went through. He lost three sons to drug overdoses. His wife committed suicide. Tragic. He, I mean, you're, yeah, tra- terrible tragedy. And yet what happened was he, you know, his, <clears throat> his remaining son and daughter, he cherished his life with them, and he could have easily gone down, you know, down a hole, down a deep hole. Uh, and, you know, he chose to, you know, um, speak to young people about the, the evils of drugs and alcohol and use his own life experiences. Uh, really a motivator, a mentor, just, you know, an all-around good guy and um, could have, you know, could have easily been taken advantage of by many, many people um, along the way and may have well been. And just, you know, to me, like, takes the high road. He could be bitter. Instead, he's thankful. Um, just a really wonderful guy. And, I mean, I, you know, I saw him fight. I mean, I was a kid. But, I mean, my, my grandfather and father says George Chevallo was never knocked off his feet. Okay? Do you know what that means? Never knocked off his feet. Fought Ali twice. Never knocked off his feet. Fought Frazier. Fought, never knocked off his feet. How about that? So, you know, that's sort of, that's a... That's kind of the, uh, you know, before the Tragically Hip ever came along, George Avala was, you know, a Canadian. He was Canadian. He fought all over the country. He was a Canadian heavyweight champion for many, many years, you know. Uh, and he, you know, he had a reputation as being like a, a down-to-the-roots, Canadian-born, proud, tough, never-say-die, never-knocked-off-his-feet, you know, lost three children and his wife killed themselves look at them go how about that and uh, I, correct me if i'm wrong did he knock ali down during their fight i don't recall i don't think so i don't think so i don't think in those days you couldn't knock ali down anyway i mean it was I a pretty tough time, fight i think the first time ali got knocked down was against frazier actually in 71 so i don't believe so i i mean i could be wrong it's possible but i don't believe so i just know that um I mean, Ali took care of him in both fights, and, you know, but there's a certain legend, I think, also to the fact that if you went the distance with Muhammad Ali, you know, that was plenty. That was plenty. Uh, yeah. Knocking him down would have been a bonus, and it would have been a, incredibly embarrassing for someone like Ali. I, I, I do believe it happened a couple of times. Maybe Frazier's wasn't the first. Maybe there were a couple of other ones, but I don't recall. And, and if so, it might have been just, you know, something nobody ever talked about. Did Shavalo ever talk to you about his fight with Ali? Oh, yeah, many times. He fought him twice. And what, oh, was, yeah. so he, what were some of his remarks go, about his fights? He could go through the entire fight, and, he, and I've seen him do it. I've been at banquets with George where, you know, he'll say, well, in the first round, and he remembers all of it. Right? I'm kidding. All of it. He could replay the entire fight for you, and he's done it, you know, it, you know, virtually the whole fight. First round, this is what happened. Second round, then he hits me here, Amazing. got me with a combo, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, but what he said about Ali was, he said he was so lightning quick that when he hit you, it was like getting hit with the end of a bull whip. It snapped. Yeah. Right? You would hear it snap. So he felt his eye, like above his eye. He explained that he felt the snapping of it. Okay, it wasn't a, it was, it was a, like a sting, but it was a, like like a, whip. a cracking sound. Yeah. And he just, he said, I remember that. He says, and I'm feeling my, you know, my, my eye is starting to swell up, <laughs> right? And so anyway, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, the guy, he fought him twice. Fought him in, in 66 at Maple Leaf Gardens, and they just had the 50th anniversary of that fight. Um, they had a big celebration in, um, in Toronto. Um, Ali was not there for that, of course. He uh, was quite ill at that time. Uh, and uh, he fought again in 72 in Vancouver. But I think by then, uh, in 72, George was, was well, like well past his prime. I mean, he was still the Canadian champion, but, and Ali had just come back, and he had lost to Frazier, 
And then I think he, I think this was in between those two fights. I think that was part of his comeback to take the title away from Frazier after Frazier had beaten him at Madison Square Garden. Boy, I can, geez, you know, when I was a kid and I, all these fights, I, I loved it. And I was a huge fan. I used to watch the Friday night fights with my grandfather. I mean, I really liked Cassius Clay. Like, who is this guy? Wow. Yeah. Well, why does he say those things? Wow. And, you know, I was just learning about the war and his stand on the war. And, and I thought, man, this guy's really something. You Exciting know? man, yes. He's really something. Exciting, man. Mark, we must bring this conversation to a close, but it has been a great one. Thank you for speaking with us about these opportunities which you had to interview these world champion boxers. Joseph, thanks for, uh, thanks for asking me on. Yeah, it's, it was nice, nice that you, you, know, you pulled a, uh, you hit a trigger. Now suddenly I'm a, like a huge boxing fan all over again. I've got to go back <laughs> over my, my notes, all the people I've spoken to. and Thanks for, um, thanks for bringing it up. It was oh. fun. Real pleasure, as always, and we hope to have you on again. Thanks so much, Mark. Take care, Joseph. You too. Take care. All the best. That was an interview with Mark Hepsher, Canadian broadcaster, on some of his interviews with champion boxers. Fantastic, exciting stuff. Mark, thanks once again. Coming up next, an interview with martial arts pioneer, legend, and champion, Benny the Jet Urquidez, here on Martial Arts World Radio. For those following along on their laptops this evening, be sure to Google the book 21st Century Perspectives on Martial Arts. You can also find that at Amazon, 21st Century Perspectives on Martial Arts. I would also encourage you to check out www.worldblackbelt.com and check out Chuck Norris's charity Kickstart Kids at www.kickstartkids.org, the charity dedicated to developing children's character through karate. You are listening to Martial Arts World Radio. We will return with our interview with Benny the Jet after these messages. This is Joseph Clark of Martial Arts World Radio. Join me Mondays at 7 p.m. for interviews and perspectives from today's and yesterday's top mixed martial artists from the UFC, full contact karate, kickboxing, and stars of martial arts cinema. That's Martial Arts World Radio, Mondays at 7 p.m. on Blue Water Radio. Everybody was kung fu fighting. Those kids were fast as lightning. In fact, it was a little bit frightening. But they fought with expert timing. Welcome back to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm Joseph Clark. Benny the Jet Urquidez had an incredible martial arts career transitioning from non-contact karate to full contact karate and kickboxing with a 27-year career in which he remained largely undefeated. He also held six world titles in five weight divisions. He has also appeared in several films as an actor opposite Jackie Chan, Samuel Hung, Patrick Swayze, James Woods, and John Cusack to name but a few. Benny, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. Do you still train and teach? You know, it's almost like you ask me, am I still breathing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's uh, just something that uh, I do. You know, to this day, uh, I'm up at 5 in the morning, my wife and I, and we're off and running and doing our thing. So um, nothing has changed. 
You know, it's uh, a lot of people would ask uh, what has changed, but there from now, I said nothing. Good for We're you. We're doing the same old, same old, bobbing and weaving. And Benny, you had a controversial fight against a Muay Thai boxer. I know this was uh, an incredible moment or a very educational moment and an eye-opener for you. Would you share that story with us? Yeah, well, actually, to tell you the truth, uh, uh, I was in Japan, and we were supposed to uh, fight this one one gentleman, and uh, he got hurt. So, uh, you know, as far as they're concerned, they, they said the uh, there's nobody to fight. My opponent turned himself. So um, they already had paid me, and, and they said they can get somebody. We could do an exhibition about, you know, get somebody else. And I said, and my brother had asked. He said, you don't have to. You know, he said, uh, you fulfilled your contract, this and that. And I said, you know, if I'm here, why not? You know, well, so as far as I was concerned, I was going to do an exhibition. And I went out there and... and uh, had a good time, yeah. Basically, it was a good time, and and as far as I was concerned, it was just an exhibition. And after it was all over with, I started to walk off. His corner man raises his uh, hand and just that, and 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 uh, you know they said, uh, he, and he's yelling and screaming like if he won. And I'm thinking, uh, I, I had you know, what, what was going on? I said, as far as I'm concerned. And I didn't really pay attention to it. I figured, hey. It's an uh, exhibition yeah. fight. But it wasn't, yeah, it was just an exhibition, but it meant nothing. And um, I walked off, you know, I walked off and, you know, just uh, laughing and so forth. And uh, I saw I, I saw my opponent. He was out there smoking. I looked at him, put thumbs up. I walked away smiling and uh, laughing with my, my brother. And uh, that was it. And... There was nothing more to it than that. And next thing I know it, somebody said that, oh, you lost. I said, I lost. I said, what do you mean? They said, yeah. So they, they showed me a video that it was so cut up that in the beginning they showed maybe 10 seconds, a, a first round uh, in the middle of it, and then they clipped to another round, and then they clipped, and then they clipped to... To a point where his corner man's raising his hand, and I, I said, "Well, whoever did this didn't do a good editing job, <laughs> you know, because uh, they definitely didn't, uh, you know, as far as I was concerned." I said, "Well, why didn't they show the whole fight if they were going to show it?" And and that was it, you know. The, there was no more, nothing to it, because uh, if to me, if it was a real fight, I would have asked for a rematch right off, right away. Right away. Right away, are you kidding me? I say, hey, you know, if if somebody wins me, I get a chance, you know, I get a chance to come back. And if he wins me again, I said, okay, so it's your turn. Yeah, but uh, you know, I, I don't I don't uh, put energy or thought into that because uh, for me, it wasn't really a fight. I wasn't really fighting. You were. I just have going out there doing whatever you know, have fun doing, and that was it. And you were fighting Western kickboxing. He was fighting Muay Thai. So how did the two styles stand up to one another? To, to tell you the truth, uh, there's no difference as far as I'm concerned. In kickboxing, I got more tools. You know? And in Muay Thai, they use elbows, knees. You know, I me- uh, that was right from the beginning. Remember, the first time, the first time Muay Thai ever came to the United States, and I was fighting. I was fighting full contact karate, which went 73 all the way to 75. No rules, no weight divisions, no just, you know, um, you know elimination. Next, uh, you win the guy, you, whoever was the next in line, you fought him. And so uh, this was in, in uh, Hawaii. The first time I fought, I think, either five or seven times on Saturday. And then on Sunday... I was fighting for the. I was supposed to fight four more times. I ended up fighting three times. The other guy didn't want to fight no more, and I ended up uh, beating Dana Goodson, uh, weighing 245 pounds, six foot three, and I'm 100. And, you know, I'm 145 pounds. Mm-hmm. So that was the beginning of full contact karate, up until '75 when 
my brother and actually Howard Hansen started the WKA, the World Karate Association, or uh, World Karate League. And so they asked me, so they were calling me a world champion. I said, well, how can I be a world champion? I haven't been outside the United States fighting like this. And so they said, you want to fight outside? I said, sure. And so, you know, two months later, they come back and said, okay, you want to fight Muay Thai? Honest to God, truth, I thought that was his name. <laughs> you, know, you know, I said, I'll fight Muay Thai. You know, I had no idea what that meant. Nobody heard of Muay Thai at the time. And so they brought two champions from uh, Thailand. And uh, I think uh, Ernest had fought the first uh, Muay Thai. I mean, he fought the first fight. Was, he was the semi-event. I was the main event. And I fought. I, I earned his heart, fought, and, and I think in the third round or the fourth round, uh, he got stopped. And then I came up. And, I, you know, now this is at the Olympic Auditorium, and the dressing room is underneath the stadium, and you can hear right. the rumbling on top. And so... I'm here in Thailand, Thailand, USA, USA, you know, and I come out, the air is so thick. And I see him in the ring, and he's he's doing his prayer. I'd never seen that before. So, you know, I was kind of, you know, I, I, I've never heard that kind of music or saw that before, and I was kind of moving around like if I was uh, dancing to his music, and all the Thai people must have thought I was making fun of him. And... And so, <laughs> so the air is getting really thick. <laughs> no, really, I had no idea. I've never seen that before. So sure. uh, he came, and next year, you know, it, he simulates uh, shooting an arrow at me, and I put thumbs up, and he, the bell rang. He came out, and I've had Charlie horses before, but I've never been thigh kicked like that before with my eyes bulged out. I said, whoa, I've never, I never had anybody intentionally trying to break my legs, and uh, and. The fight went all the way up until the ninth round. And, uh, you know, the, the the first round, I went back to my brother, and I said, what do I do? And he says, kick him back. And I said, oh, yeah. I went back, and I kicked him, and he late, he late checked me. Oh, that even hurt it worse. <laughs> Man, that hurt it so bad. I said, that, that was, I said, okay, I'm not going to kick him again like that. This was so, a new experience for you, Benny. Yeah, oh, yeah. I've never felt that before. I've never felt uh, anybody late uh, check me before. And then he started clinching me and elbowing me and so forth. And all the Americans thought he was cheating because they'd never seen that before. Sure. And so I didn't know what to do. My brother didn't know what to tell me what to do. So I'm a good judo man. So I ended up picking him up and throwing him on his head. And every time he clinched me to knee me, I threw him on, you know, I threw him. And all the Thai people think I'm cheating because they've never seen that before. And so next year or not, all the Americans, all the Thais are getting really uh, heated up and so forth. And the ninth round, a fight started up uh, in, uh, in the audience, <laughs> oh, and boy. it went like a, it went like a wave <laughs> all the way around the audience. And they stopped the fight, saying, "You know, no contest, no contest," because um, they were afraid that uh, they were going to fight. I said, "It's too late." And so I stopped. I jumped in the ropes. I because my mother and my sisters were there, and I watched my brothers escorted them out and. But it was uh, the first time ever introduced to Muay Thai uh, fighting. So after that, I looked at it, and I said, okay. That's when I started designing shin guards and so forth because, uh, you know, I, I really never thought that. But after watching him leg check me and so forth, then I started developing leg checking and so forth. And uh, make sure I know it. Uh, I have, uh, they're, they're giving me an invitation to Japan because they want to know who is this American just finished uh, uh, fighting this uh, Thai guy. A controversial guy, uh, champion. And uh, it went on and on. And so when I went to Japan, you know, it, I mean, it just goes on and on. Uh, but that was the first time of ever Muay Thai coming to the United States uh, being introduced. So I had a chance to take this because I wanted to know what this Thai guy was doing because to me, he was bringing out emotions out of me like if I was back in the streets. And that's when I started to realize 
that that's the kind of that's the kind of fighting I want to know. And that was internal. That's when I started really thinking about internal training because of that Thai guy uh, actually putting that kind of pressure on me, and 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 it actually opened my eyes to the art of war. And that's when I started uh, when they invited me to Japan. I you know I I'm a martial artist. And so they told me I couldn't wear long pants, and I had to wear shorts. And I said, well, then I'm not fighting because I'm a martial artist first. Because, you know, I, I, and kickboxing, you know, kickboxing was born in 76. Why? Because everybody kept on saying, what's full contact karate? What does that mean? You know, like you, you box and then you add some legs or you kicking sure. and then you add some punching. And so the, the word was kickboxing where everybody understood and that's when uh, I started traveling around the world, understanding this type of fighting. And anybody that challenged me uh, in their country, I went to their country fighting under their rules, under their fans, under their judges. And, and that's just how it all started. I started building the sport of kickboxing around the world. Now, Benny, if we can change lanes for just a moment. Sure. I understand because you've done a lot of film work as a result of martial arts. I believe you worked with Patrick Swayze on the film Roadhouse. Is that correct? Absolutely. I matter of fact, I doubled him on some of the some thing, but I was the stunt coordinator on it, and uh, and so we uh, it was a lot of fun. It would, to tell you the truth, um, I really didn't think it was work. It, I, it felt we had such a good time such a good time and so forth, and um, teaching Patrick, you know, and him coming from a dancing background, and when I started teaching him technique, uh, he started getting very frustrated because he was he was getting angry at himself because he says, I'm a dancer, I should know how to do all this, these, these different moves, and I was showing him something different of rhythm, and for the first couple of days, I saw him be real frustrated, and I went home, and I started putting some technique, and I started putting music together, and I started doing these techniques with music, and and I went back the next day, and I told him, I said, I'm going to try something different, and I said, you know, here, I want you to follow this rhythm, and I turned on some music, and once I did that, I was in his element, I was in his backyard, he, man, he lit up. And we had a blast every since, and every workout was with music. <laughs> so it, it was a lot of fun with Patrick, and uh, truly incredible, incredible warrior and actor. I really had a a good time, and we became good friends. It sounds like you really connected with him. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, it's uh, with most actors. Usually, the first week, they always give me a hard time. The first week. And after that, once I earned their trust, you know, then they allow me to push them right to the edge. And, and they trust themselves that they can handle anything that I push in front of them. So there's a collaboration of, of trust going back and forth. Now, Benny, you and I are in preliminary discussions about possibly collaborating on a book that speaks to your personal philosophy on internal right. martial arts. And should we proceed with this book, we'll definitely keep the listening audience cued in as to its progress over time. And obviously a half an hour is not enough time I, I to do I think that everybody is interview. looking, you know, for a longest time, uh, a lot of people didn't want to hear about the spirituality of warfare. You know, it was more external instead of internal. And a lot of people you want to stay away from that um, and they a lot of people would look at it as a religion and so forth and which it had nothing to do with religion but that's how they interpret it but as time went on they started to recognize that most of the fight was internal and anytime they were threatened everything they hid under their bed in their closet came up anger would follow anger is fear would follow fear frustration would follow frustration, anxieties, and all these emotions that's been taught and programmed to them was coming up. And they wanted to know. And right now, people are ready for this type of book. You know, the book I wrote before, uh, it was about 
how the jet became the jet. But this book that we were talk, we're talking about, we're talking about an internal book, in who I really am, and, and in my background, in my my walk on this earth, and basically it's the fight. You know, I heard somebody say it's a, a a third space, once upon a time, and to me, you know, truly a third space. You know, is we're talking about places that we go, and I talk about the square jungle, which is the ring, is a metaphor of your home, your work, okay, and the place you train, or people around you. And so, in that, you know, uh, all these emotions that's been programmed, you know, sometimes when people get angry for petty stuff, they're still drawing from past tendons, from stuff that they've been wounded way back then, and yes, they, you know, if that was, they did do that, but that's not who they are. That's just what they've done. Just like me, people think they know me by what I've done, but I said, that's not who I am. That's just what I've done. And so I think this book, that people are really, uh, would really want to hear, would really want to read, would really want to see uh, is turning themselves inside out, mirroring their truth. And I, and I believe this is the book that is really needed and necessary. And this is what you and I were talking about, that uh, this is something that the audience, I think, would really find, you know, that this would, you know, they can mirror their truth, they can look at themselves and really take a good look at themselves and uh, be able to, have the courage, you know, have the courage to actually say, okay, I can see this. Instead of running from it, you know, as you know, everything we run from, we run into. Instead of running from it is being able to take a really good look and have the courage to stay in it. And I believe if they had the courage to stay in it 10 seconds, to be in it for 10 minutes, because all it takes is 10 seconds of courage to decide, I'm going to do it, stay in it 10 minutes, and it does change your life. And I think this is what the audience are looking for is, you know, not the, an idea. They're looking for the solutions. And I think the book will bring out a lot of solutions in people. Internal martial arts. Would you say that internal martial arts is you know, getting to know arts. oneself and being able to face those fears and being able to to resist you know, what, temptation, what, what resist temper, and so forth. Is truly an internal means to me. Things that move us and things that stop us, and usually, it's a program that we've been taught from our first teachers, which is usually our parents, whoever raised us. You know, they teach us their emotions for protection. And sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's fear, sometimes it's frustration, sometimes it's anxieties. But they're teaching this for us so they can protect us. But what happens is we start to forget our brilliance. And that's basically what happens is the internal is to be able to forget what you know and remember what you've forgotten. And what you know is a program, and what you've forgotten is your brilliance of coming in this world and why you exist, why you're here. I think this book will answer a lot of these questions that our people are looking for and are really looking for solutions of, okay, if you tell me how to do it, it's one way, but if you show me how to do it, it's another, because everybody receives information differently. So this book will tell them, it will show them, and when it comes to a point where we can do seminars, we'll physically actually do it with them. Are you incorporating this philosophy into your training with your students today? I'm sorry, you, you, you kind of went off. Are you incorporating this philosophy into your training with your current students? You know, right now, uh, this type of training is a way of life. From the time the I am concept of what they say, 
when they open up their eyes when they get up because it really makes a big difference of what, they, you know, the I am concept of what they say to themselves. And if they think, you know, oh, how they're going to make it through the day, then exactly, they're struggling through the day. But if they're getting up and being thankful that they had this day to do the things they love doing and be with people they love being with, then there's a chemical in that system that if they practice it, it's, there's an excitement of, for this whole day being in the moment. And so I teach my students exactly that. I teach them meditation. I teach them the concentration meditation into a power meditation, into the action meditation. It is because sometimes that's what we need. We need to have focus on what we want and our soul can manifest it. Yeah? And so without sight of what we want, our body doesn't know which way to go. And, you know, and, and we need heroes. You know, we need heroes in life that we may look at, that they end up, you know, that we may take the better things from the, our heroes and make them our, ours and modify them for ourselves. And then the mantras are what you tell yourself in the morning. And the mantras are very important because that's a program. But when you say it to yourself, you are programmed. If somebody else is saying it to you, they're suggesting this way. But if you're saying it to yourself, you are now programming a new way of looking, thinking, hearing, tasting, smelling, opening up all your senses. So I teach my students. When they come in, they all sit down and they start to prepare the concentration meditation so their mind, body, and soul is in one place because they can actually be there physically, but if, they, if their mind is on their bills, on their worries, on their whatever is outside the dojo, which is a sanctuary, and they bring that in the sanctuary, then they only brought one part of them. They didn't line themselves up. So the meditation lines them up to, in other words, it's their time. So when I ask them, whose time is this? They say, my time. Well, if it is your time, then delete everything else because this is your time. Bring your mind, body, and soul in one place. And so I teach them right off the bat. The teaching is about being, being present mentally, physically, and spiritually before I can teach them anything. Benny, obviously this is uh, not a surprise to me because we've had previous discussions, and I'm glad that this discussion has gone in the direction it has because it's deep and... For listeners, they're either prepared for this or they are not. I hope to have you on the air frequently and that we can continue talking about the development of this book because I feel that it's important and I feel that there's a, a, a philosophy here and a self-realization that we can all benefit from. So I'm grateful that you brought this up and that you touched about it today. Now I must ask you about your other book for a moment, The Jet, Right? I'm looking at a website, which is www.bennythejet.com. And briefly, That's right. what is the book The Jet about? You know, it's about how I became the jet. You know, it's about how I was raised. You know, I come from a family. My father, you know, professional boxer. My mother, professional wrestler. Nine black belts in my family. Four champions in my family. I come from a fighting family. So when kids at three years old, you know, had fire trucks, I had boxing gloves. So we entertain each other by, you know, um, <laughs> boxing, fighting with each other, you know, and, and uh, so for, for actually five decades, I, I've been doing warfare. So my mother, being a Native American, and my father being Spaniard, uh, my mother was very internal, very spiritual. And my mother would always talk to me about the spirituality, the understanding why people do the things they do. And my father was very external. He was very physical. And he would show me to be strong, to not show emotions, to hit harder, to move faster, to have more endurance. And so he was so external. But my mother was so internal that they both gave me a balance. 
with all my all my family, you know, uh, we we all had balance because of both of them. But my mother was the one that was really influencing, you know, really influenced me, an internal understanding uh, about different energies between the male energy, between the female energy, and and my sister. I have four sisters, and they were teaching about female energy, and I was thinking, what do I care? I'm just a kid, you know. Uh, I, you know, why would I want to know about that? I'm so glad, you know. I mean, they were talking about my hygiene at 10 years old, and I'm thinking, well, manicure? Are you crazy? I manicure? I was so embarrassed, you know. <laughs> but this was uh, this was something that they were teaching me. I'm so glad they they were able to teach me, and I was, you know, and they actually forced me. I mean, I caught myself sometimes crying because I didn't want to. You know, I I didn't want nobody to know that they were actually, uh, you know, giving me manicures and pedicures and telling me this and that. And um, I, I I really felt I really felt very embarrassed. But I grew up extra fast. So by the time I was 14, uh, I was already holding titles because you know, back I was doing boxing in the, uh, 58. In 60, I started judo. In 63, I started kempo karate. And so from that, back in the 60s, the mark of a warrior it was, I mean, we, we fought bare knuckles, you know. And there was no such thing as safety chops, safety kicks. Not, it, you know, that didn't come into the 70s. But the, the mark of a warrior was tape around their knuckles, tape around the two toes. You knew that that warrior came here for business and and throwing out each other on concrete and wood and, you know, it, that's just the way we fought back then. And, you know, we were bleeding all over the place, but yet we were bound. And there was the prosciutto respect. There was a code of honor between warriors back in the 60s. Even though we fought bare knuckles and, and slamming each other and so forth, you know, we'd be bleeding, but yet we would still respect one another. And it, even if my opponent lost, he would bow, he would smile, and give me thumbs up, and in his eyes, you would say, until I see you next time. And, there and so was, there was that code of honor between warriors. There was that code of honor between warriors. Benny, we must close off, because we're down to our last 60 seconds of the show for today. Okay. However, I hate to interrupt. However, it has been a true privilege, and we look forward to speaking with you often so that we can expound even more and elaborate on what you have to share with us. And I thank you so much for joining us. It really was a privilege. Uh, my pleasure, John. You. you know what? Uh, again, I look forward again to uh, come on and, and share information, share uh, knowledge and experience with everybody. Well, as do we, and we appreciate your sharing of it. Have a great night. You too. Be sure to tune in next week for more candid discussions and perspectives with stars of the Octagon, Full Contact Karate, Kickboxing, and Martial Arts Cinema. You've been listening to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm Joseph Clark.